we know where we are coming from, where we are, more or less, let's see where we're going. Next, you will hear a presentation in English, and we will be talking about the future of work. And next, I would like to ask uh, the OECD future work expert, uh, uh, Paolo Falco, uh, to come to the stage to talk to us about what is the future work landscape will look like. Thank you. That's the clicker. Great. <clears throat> well, first of all, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for having me here in uh, this beautiful city and in this fantastic hall. And let me begin by saying that no place could be more appropriate than this one to talk about the transformations that are occurring in the economy and in the labor market. As far as I understand, this used to be a power plant, and now we're all here doing very different jobs from uh, what the people that used to work in this place did, and yet using this place. So quite a sign of transformation. So I am an economist at the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, of which uh, Estonia is um, a member. And uh, in particular, I work in the Directorate for Employment, Labor, and Social Affairs, where I'm involved in a project on the future of work. And what do we try to do in this project? Well, essentially, we try to understand how a number of what we call mega trends, which are major forces that are impacting the economy and the world at large, are changing the labor market. What are the forces that we have in mind? Well, here's a selection of them. Here are the most important ones. We think about technology and digitalization. We think about the forces of globalization. We think about the fact that societies are aging. So the demographic composition of the world and of our nations is changing. And we ask, how are these different trends impacting what jobs will be created, what jobs will be destroyed, how, where, and by whom will these jobs be conducted? And this is an activity that started at the OECD over two years ago now. And here you see our Secretary General launching, opening a forum on the future of work. But before we I tell you a bit about the answers, some of the answers to, some, to the questions that uh, I would like to discuss with you today. Let me give you a little bit of context on these three mega trends. First of all, being in Estonia, being Estonia a very uh, technologically adva rapidly advancing country, I don't need to convince you that technology is changing the world of work. Here I'm, I'm giving you one stark example, one that everybody has in mind, robots. And you see that uh, the annual supply of industrial robots throughout the world is growing very much exponentially. We also know that societies are aging. This changes the composition of what we do, of the services we provide, of the goods we provide but also of the labor force itself. And we're going from a world where there's going to be one retired person for every four people of retirement age in 2015, or a couple of years ago, to a world in 2050, and these are pretty accurate projections, where there's going to be only two people working for every person who is retired. And you can see that these will have major implications about all that we're going to talk about today. And then finally, the world is a more integrated place. Here I'm showing you in the major, in the largest OECD economies, what is the share of jobs that directly depends on trade with other countries. And it's a very direct measure of globalization and of how integrated economies are. And you see that it's very large. On average in the OECD, 30% of jobs depend directly on foreign demand. And now let's go into the questions that we're interested in today. And what I'm going to do is answer one main question that is part of our analysis and then give you a broader sense, a broader overview of what our general narrative on the future of work is. We can't go into all the details of it for lack of time, but I invite you to follow our work and in particular to follow the release of our forthcoming publication on the future of work, which will be released on April 25th, is going to be the OECD Employment Outlook, one of our main publications that is going to be entirely dedicated to the future of work. And there you're going to see all the details of what I'm discussing today and a lot more. But let's begin with the main question I want to talk with you this morning about. 
What can we expect from the fourth industrial revolution? Well, in fact, this question can be posed in a much more direct way. It's something that is worrying everyone, and it is, are robots going to take our jobs and leave us unemployed? This is a question that uh, we have tackled by starting from a result that uh, has grabbed the headlines around the world. is the result of a paper that came out of the University of Oxford that said that 47% of jobs in the US labor market are at risk of being automated. What we did was essentially go into the details of that analysis, and instead of looking at jobs as a whole, we tried to look at jobs as a collection of different tasks, of different activities. And when we look at what people do in detail, we find that even in jobs that seem automatable for the most part, there are still some tasks that are very much human and that need people to do them. And once you do that, you find out that actually the share of jobs at risk of being automated away is only 14% in OECD countries on average. And here you can find that Estonia is probably right around the, a little bit below the average number as far as I can see. It's about, it's right there, 12, 13%. But let me tell you that what is more interesting in this analysis is that even if the share of jobs that are completely automatable may, may be relatively small, what is very large and is a 30% on top of this 14% is the share of jobs that will significantly change as a result of technology. What do we mean by significantly change? We mean that a fraction of the tasks, a significant fraction of the tasks that people do in those jobs may disappear due to automation, but the job as a whole will stay. What is the implication? And the, this is the first direct connection with the world of skills and the world of qualifications that you're in. People will need to learn new things. People will need to learn how to do their jobs in a different way. And what are the activities that are more or less prone to be automated? And therefore, what is it that people should learn going forward? And here we come to the heart of the matter for a conference on skills and qualifications. Well, the activities that are least prone to automation are the most inherently human ones. They're the ones that are about presenting to others, influencing others, working with others, writing and thinking creatively, so all activities that machines are not very good at. The machines at the bottom, on the other hand, are, ma sorry, the activities, I mean, that are at the bottom of this table, on the other hand, are activities that are already automated or in the process of being automated. So acquiring skills that were about buying and selling, exchanging information, basic manual dexterity, these are skills that we see in our analysis are probably on their way out because robots are better at this. And this is all obviously something that is quite intuitive, but let me tell you that it comes out of the data. So when we look at data on what people actually do in their jobs, we see that these two groups of skills come out as more or less automatable. In fact, less automatable at the top, more automatable at the bottom. But let me add a caveat, an important one, to this analysis, and I think a caveat that should be going with any analysis on the future of work. What we say is that it's important when thinking about what will happen in the future of work not to fall prey to what we call the fallacy of technological determinism. What sounds like a complicated world, word to say that people have the tendency to think that because a technology exists somewhere in a lab, it will necessarily take over the world. That is a very big assumption. It's a very big leap in the reasoning. And why is that? Because there are many other factors other than technology that may favor its spread or prevent it and may therefore facilitate automation or stop automation. And in particular here, I want to show you one factor, which is people's preferences, consumer preferences, which tell us that essentially not in every domain, people are going to be as interested in having technology replace humans. And uh, let me show you a stark example that comes from Eurobarometer data. If you ask people, where would you like to see robots used, they show you that they tell you that 
They're very much in favor of robots when it comes to space exploration, manufacturing, search and rescue missions. But when it comes to something like healthcare and education, even if robots exist or existed in some of these domains, they don't exist yet, but people would be very skeptical of having a nurse replaced by a robot or having a teacher replaced by a robot. Of course, you could tell me that this is going to change as the years of the future come, but for the time being, even if the technology exists, let's be careful in making the assumption that it's necessarily going to change our lives. And finally, I want to add one more caveat, which is that we discuss this future world business as if it's for the first time, as if we've never seen this before, as if technology is changing the world now, but it never did it in previous ages. And you already see where I'm going. You only need to see this building to figure out that the kind of transformations that we're talking about have already occurred in the past. And in fact, here is a very stark representation of what I mean. This is a cover page of Der Spiegel, three different cover pages, in 64, 78, and 2016. And you don't need to speak German to figure out what they are saying. Pretty much exactly the same thing. The robots are coming to take our jobs. And yet, Throughout this period, employment has never fallen pretty much anywhere with some minor exceptions in the world. So the overarching conclusion that comes out of this, technology is unlikely to have the effect on the labor market of creating a job loss overall. It's unlikely that there's going to be fewer jobs in the future. The punchline is that there may be very different jobs in the future and skill education qualification systems are going to play a key role in facilitating the transition. And here we come with our overall narrative, our overall story on the future work which will be enshrined in that document I told you about that's going to be released on April 25th. We look at it in three parts. We look at the future work in three parts. The first part is precisely what I've just told you, job quantity. The quantity of jobs in the labor market is not going to fall. Or at the very least, it's very unlikely to fall, simply because if we look at history, technology has not created a net job loss. It's creating a huge transformation of jobs, but overall, the number of jobs has kept increasing with technology. So it's really about managing the transition. It's about helping people, especially from certain backgrounds and the more disadvantaged ones, to take the opportunities that the world will create. On the other hand, job quality, so the quality of the jobs that will be created, poses some challenges. And here the challenges are first of all about the fact that throughout the world we are seeing wage stagnation. So even if employment is rising, we see that earnings are not going along. And we also see that there is an emergence of new forms of work, of more precarious work in many ways, that causes an array of problems because while it, could, it counts as employment and it gives people something to live on, it's very unstable. And that obviously has implications for workers' welfare. And finally, the most important challenge will be about creating an inclusive labor market, one where truly everyone, no matter their background, can participate in society in a productive way, can have access to the opportunities that the future work will afford, and will not be locked, locked out for lack of resources. And since we are here today discussing that topic, let me stress, for lack of skills, for lack of having learned something that is useful in the labor market. So where do we go from here? We are the OECD, we come up with policy recommendations based on our analysis of the challenges that exist in the labor market. Here is our policy tree. As you can see, the policy areas that we cover in this project are several and very broad. They span from skills to social protection, labor market regulation, activation policies, and social dialogue. And today in particular, guess what? I'm going to zoom in on skills to tell you a little bit about the challenges that we see at the macro level and hopefully 
to inform the conversation that we're having today about qualification policies. So skills. The question there is, since I've told you that workers in the future are going to need different skills, does it look like they have those skills? Does it look like the majority of workers have the skills of the future? And the answer is unfortunately no. Pretty much wherever you look, including Estonia, you find that if you concentrate of workers who are, who are in the labor market, this is a picture of workers who are in employment, and you concentrate on a precise measure of skills for the future, here we call them problem-solving skills in technology-rich environments, a very long sentence to essentially say the ability to use computers. You find that at least 50% of the adult population, of the adult labor force, either has very little skills or no skills at all when it comes to using technology. And let me say that this is something that is not self-reported. This comes out of a test. It's part of a survey that the OECD ran across countries where we went and met with workers and asked them to take a simple test based on using simple technology, and this is what came out. You could say this is a generational issue. In 20 years, everybody will be able to use these tools. I will be cautious there. If I'm not mistaken, if you restrict this analysis to young people, you still find that a good 30% has this kind of problem. And going forward, going into the solutions, how well our, are our job training systems doing in filling these gaps? How well are they helping people to develop skills? Here I'm showing you something very specific. This is on the job training, so the percentage of people who take some kind of training on the job. And what we find, again, looking at data from the same survey we've used for the previous analysis, is that the education systems, rather the job training systems, which are not education systems, this is on the job training, it's a very peculiar form of training, but a very important one, are doing pretty much the opposite of what they should be doing. Why am I saying that? Because in this graph, you see that the people who need training the most, these are the blue bars, get the least. And the people who get who need training the least get the most. And these are the red spots. Let me explain why I'm saying this. What this chart shows you is enrollment in training by level of literacy, which is essentially a measure that tells you how good a worker was before he even went or she even went into the training. And we find that the most literate workers, the ones who are best to begin with, the orange dots, are much more likely to get training than the ones who are the least competent, the least proficient, who are the ones with the blue bars. You could say, well, this is to be, uh, to be expected. These are firms making their decisions about who to train. They're going to train their best workers. Well, if that is the case, then the answer is we need better public-private partnerships to ensure that what the market doesn't provide is provided by the public purse or at least by a partnership between the public and the private. <coughs> and this takes me to my conclusion, which is about the OECD emerging policy orientations, so the first embryo of our recommendations, in particular with regard to skills and adult learning. This is only one section of the work that we're doing, but I thought I will zoom into this one because they're particularly important. And given the challenges I've told you about, given the fact that we need new skills, and given the fact that some workers cannot access those skills, what are our recommendations? Well, first of all, we need to put increasing effort into increasing the participation into training and qualification systems of underrepresented groups. The challenges I've told you about are about inclusiveness. They're about the fact that some workers have a harder time getting into qualification systems and into training systems. 
Employers and unions should play a central role. This is a, a concerted effort. It's not just the government, it's, just one, it's not just one of the actors involved. The quality of training and its alignment with skill needs should be monitored. So this is about keeping our training courses up to date. And finally, it's going to be important to have effective governance and financing systems to provide not only the resources, which should partly come from the public sector, partly from the private sectors, sector, but also the incentives to use those resources well, the incentives for workers to enroll in these programs, and the incentives to evaluate these programs and make sure that they deliver the results that they're designed for. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much. Thank you. Please, have a seat. I enjoyed your presentation very much. Uh, what I found there was a reassuring note, that the future does not look as gloomy as it often is portrayed. But then again, it is a challenge, and we need to face it, because nothing is for granted, and we still need to prepare for it. Uh, you mentioned that we need to treat jobs as a collection of tasks, and hence we need to reform, and they will be automated, certain parts of it. And people need to learn how to do their jobs in a better, more digital way. That's a reassuring message, isn't it? Yeah. Provided that we do a good job at giving wide access to the systems of qualification and training that people will need in order to accomplish that. Because that's all very nice and indeed may sound reassuring, but the problem is that when you look into the details of this, is that uh, some groups in society are disenfranchised. They're mm -hmm. locked out. Yep. They, find it, they find it a lot more difficult to mm -hmm. get these types of qualifications than others. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you can, you can imagine that somebody working late hours you know, in a supermarket, it's very difficult for them to escape that loop. Indeed. Having perhaps a child, being a single parent, single mother, all of these things, right, make indeed. it extremely difficult to escape that situation. Indeed. indeed, indeed, indeed. And that is why I think it's time that in many countries we move away from the simple, or beyond, I should say, the simple rhetoric of uh, the simple empty words of we need to do more for our adult learning systems and actually devote not only resources but efforts to understand what works and what doesn't work. Because very often the problem is that even countries that have these qualification systems don't do a good job at evaluating them, mm -hmm. don't do, a good, jobs at, uh, don't do a, a good job at doing the kind of fine tuning of the mechanisms that ultimately is what you need to understand what actually helps workers acquire skills and what is instead potentially a waste of resources. Let's take a few questions from the audience. If we could have the questions here up here on the screen here. Um, let me get my screen here as well. I'll, I'll guide you through that. Um, let's take this for example. What can one person do to future-proof their career now? Is people's fear of robotization disabling development or adding speed to it? Well, what can people do to uh, future-proof their career now? I would say, and this is probably something that a lot of people in this room are very, very clear in their minds, but I believe society at large does not, is move away from the mindset of the past that used to be one of, I'm going to acquire all the skills I need when I'm young, I will get out of school and use those skills for the rest of my life, to a mindset that will say, I essentially need to be a constant learner. I will be a student for my whole life. I may even need, and this could be the future, to go back to school at some point. I might need to take additional education in my late 30s, my 40s, my 50s, my 60s. And that, I think, is first of all a paradigm shift, a change of mentality. Because at the moment, it either sounds weird to the worker, or it sounds very weird to the employer. Well, it's uncomfortable anyway. It's uncomfortable, but also 
and this is an important part, I think, of the change, employers need to come to terms with the fact that if a worker goes back to school in their 40s or their 50s, it's not because they failed somewhere on the way, but simply because they needed to change something that needed improvement and fine-tuning, simply because everybody needs to do that. And it's not a bad signal in a CV, as uh, I'm afraid it was and mm -hmm. still is for many employers. Key, one of the key skills is learning how to learn. Yep. And it's not a stigma to go back to school. Absolutely not. Well, that is reassuring again. But yeah, it's a change in paradigm yep. and mentality. Let's take another question from, uh, from the uh, World Wide Web. Uh, let's see here. If technology has the potential to increase jobs, but the number of people working is decreasing, what will happen in the future? If the number of people working is decreasing? Yes. Well, we don't know that. When we say that societies are aging, we don't necessarily mean that in the future this is set in stone. First of all, because the um, increasing like in first and foremost, because the increasing life expectancy may also dictate an increase in working lives. So the, the, the uh, chart we started from, which said, which showed you statistics projecting from today to the future about the dependency ratio, the ratio of people working to people retiring, is based on current levels of uh, retirement age, which may change. Having said that, of course, the trend is going in that direction. And uh, it's hard to imagine that we're going to completely undo it by changing working ages. Otherwise, I wouldn't have even started from that. And the other thing to consider in that case is that when we say that jobs are increasing, employment is increasing, we're always thinking about it. Well, so far it's been true in absolute numbers. But what you mostly care about is as a share of the total number of working people. So of the number of people who want a job, what is the share of them that can actually get one? And that is unlikely to decrease in the future. Of course, we will need to inevitably balance the number and the amount of resources that we have coming from the people who are working with the people who are retiring. And that will be the challenge of the future. But uh, it's um, by no means, I would say, as a conclusion, an equation that has been entirely squared because there are some moving parts. We don't know how much the retirement age will change. We don't know what is going to be the absolute number of jobs that uh, may or may not change in dramatic ways. Most likely, it will not go down. And then we should square that with the total number of people who are left wanting and able to find a job. And that will tell us what the ratio of jobs to retired people and what jobs to inactive people will ultimately be. Let's take a few questions from the audience. I think we have time for two questions. We can take questions from the audience with microphones. I'll say this in Estonian. Te võite ka küsimusi küsida otsa saalist mikrofonidega. Meil on inimesi nii vasakul kui paremal, kelle käes on mikrofon ja tõske käsi, kui teil on küsimusi, mida te tahaksite küsida otsa. Kas Eesti või inglise keeles? No nii, palun mikrofoni siia keskele. Mikrofoni, no nii, palun. Uh, hello, I am Mario Laurest, I am professor from Tartu University and I am dealing with uh, uh, reform in education. And in this reform, we are very much excited about the work done by OECD, this framework for education 2030. And my question is, uh, what about your cooperation? You are dealing with skills and employment, and the other department is dealing with education. And for us, it's always a problem, the barriers, the silo towers. So how about silo towers in OECD? Are you working together? And could you give us a good model how to work together between people working with employment and people working with education? Absolutely. So. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, I'm afraid the, the silo approach is something that uh, we struggle with a bit ourselves. I'm sure it's true of any big organization that has different departments. But we do have what we call horizontal projects, which we make a greater 
and greater effort in, which are about working across. And uh, there are obviously a number of collaborations in the areas of skills, if anything, because we have our remit within the domain of uh, the labor department that is about upskilling the labor force, but uh, the skills come from the education system, and obviously the education people are the ones who are primarily concerned with that. And uh, in particular, we now have a, a joint center that is uh, headed by the two directorates jointly that is working on, among other things, the adult learning issues that I've been telling you about. So from that point of view, what uh, I can say, first of all, is that if you're interested in our work, you will find that we have made an effort in uh, trying to bridge these gaps and making sure that we collaborate and uh, we don't duplicate work to the extent possible. And second, if you're interested more, generally, interested more generally in how such a model can work in other organizations, in the way that it's worked at the OECD has been precisely to encourage this kind of horizontal project. So typically from the top of the organization, there has been an increasing drive towards uh, encouraging different directorates to doing a project together. And typically that means that you attach some resources, some funding to the overall project and then different units can uh, tap into that and it's understood that the product eventually will be joined. And there is uh, one last um, example I can give you of that, which is about something called the Going Digital Project of the OECD, which is another big project that is going to be delivered soon. And that is, uh, at the moment, probably the prime example of horizontal collaboration. There are, I believe, 14 different directors of the OECD, 14 collaborating to that project. And uh, it's going to be about how technology will change not only the labor market, but the economy more generally. And obviously, this project on the future of work feeds into that. So you already, from the outset, if you begin a new project, two directorates or 14 yes. is already designed in the process that indeed. you need to share teams and, and, and resources for indeed. that. Indeed, mm. indeed, indeed. Let's take one more question from right. the audience. Yks küsimus veel, kes soib küsida? Ja kui ma saalist kätte näe, siis ma võtan internetist küsimus. If I don't see a question from the audience. Uh, right. What are the three main characteristics of an occupation that is robotization proof? Oof. Well, um, I would say, you know, the easy escape for this question would be to say something that is inherently human, but what is human? In my opinion, it's about creativity, it's about communication, and it's about empathy. So, Creativity, because uh, at least for the moment, even the most advanced algorithms are algorithms. They are repetitive in nature. The communication part comes from the fact that, um, and it's very much linked to the third element I'm gonna mention, but the communication part is uh, about teamwork, it's about influencing others and uh, managing others and uh, interacting in ways that creates new ideas. So it's also very connected to creativity. And then empathy is something that uh, philosophically you could say by design a machine cannot give you because it's very much linked to the human condition. It's the fact that a human feels for another. Now we could say that in the more or less instant future we're going to be developing a, a version of empathy that involves a machine caring for a human or a machine caring for a machine. But at the moment, the very meaning of the word is so intrinsically linked to the status of a human being that almost by definition, it is something that will not exist, will not be feasible to automate. And there are plenty of professions that involve these skills. Think about any profession that has to do with education, Think about any profession that has to do with healthcare. Think about uh, professions that uh, have to do with uh, creative thinking and uh, designing and uh, coming up with new ideas in a collaborative way. And uh, I would say these are skills that uh, not only will be important, but will be increasingly important, and they need to become part, and some countries are making an effort in this respect of uh, our school curricula. So we need to make a greater effort to this. In fact, I read recently that Denmark, I'm not sure at what level or in what school system, has introduced classes in empathy. So trying to essentially 
develop people, to, under, to, 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 uh, to help people develop social skills and the ability not only to communicate with each other, but uh, to um, emotionally connect with each other in ways that machines would not be able to do. Uh, that, that rings a bell. I may have read the same article about that. What's interesting is that in, in Sweden, for example, there was recently a study on uh, how the recruitment uh, landscape has changed uh, during the past year. What do employers look at? Uh, so because talent is scarce and you can't find those things, you can't find the right set of age, experience, skills, etc. Uh, then they have uh, sort of managed their lowered their expectations when it comes to experience. Yeah. Uh, if you know this and that, the other programming language, etc. All of the things they've managed to lower their expectations, except in one aspect, and that is how a potential new recruit fits to the company culture. Yeah. That the employers have not backed down from. A very soft thing, but as numbers show, a very important one too. Indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.